The following never-before-seen footage captures the chilling moment the two detectives are led into the woods by a killer where they make a horrifying discovery. I bet if you pull that tarp back a little bit more, it's going to uncover. There's a black sheet like something right here. I don't know if you can pull it. See that right there? It was the morning of October 16th, 2016, when Chris Poss reported his 18-year-old son Sam missing. According to Chris, Sam had left late the previous night to help a friend, 17-year-old Dakota White, with some computer problems. But Sam never made it home, having vanished into the night without a trace. It was unusual for Sam to be out of contact for so long, as he was known to be responsible and considerate. According to his father, Chris, Sam could be clever and sarcastic, a bit of a charming smart aleck at times, but he was especially kind and giving and willing to help anyone at the drop of a hat. At first, only Sam's family was looking for him, but as the day went on, the search became more desperate. Sam's father decided to involve the police once he realized his son wasn't with any of his friends. In fact, none of them had even heard from Sam since the night before. A large foot search soon took place. In addition to law enforcement, family, friends, neighbors, and even strangers came out to search for Sam. A helicopter and multiple canine units were called in to help, but despite the monumental effort, there was still no sign of Sam. In an exclusive interview with Iwu, Brayson, who was 19 years old at the time and a close friend of Sam's, recounts what it was like to realize Sam was missing. Uh, we planned on going to the, the state fair. I made plans to go over that night to like hang out with him, and so that way in the morning we can just go straight to the fair. I had to work late, so I told him, don't worry about it. I'll let uh, Christian come pick me up tomorrow. And the text messages are called Dad because that's just how it was. I've known him since I was like eight. So I get home and go to sleep, wake up the next morning. I, I get a call from Chris asking me like if I've heard anything from Sam or seen him. And I said, no, that's a little weird. He's like, oh, okay, well, maybe he's at the fair, something like that. So we go to the fair, we run around, we're looking for him, can't find him. Most of the like the time after that, it was just kind of a blur. We just sort of like really one thing after another. We just kept looking. Police approached Sam's girlfriend, hoping she might be able to shed some light on the situation. The following footage has never been seen before. It's been analyzed by a licensed professional counselor. You know where you could possibly be? I've been thinking about that and I just, I have no idea. Because all of his friends places that he might be, mm -hmm. they're trying to get a hold of me and ask me if I know where he is. It kills me. Because what if something bad happens? True. That's what we're trying to find out. Even while interviews with Sam's friends were still in process, Dakota, the last person to see Sam, took to Facebook and posted multiple news links and asked everyone to keep looking. Pretty much when the relationship ended, um, two or three weeks ago, what? we were both going through a really rough time and we just couldn't deal with each other and deal with our problems at the same time. What kind of problems? I guess. We both were kind of struggling with depression. Mm -hmm. Investigators also decided to speak with Dakota, the last person to see Sam. Dakota had participated in the earlier foot search, and while investigators had already spoken with him at his house, they decided to bring him into the station for a more structured interview. Just like I said, you know, you done told me already, but we need to go over with um, a little bit more thorough than I find you back here. But take you back to... Uh, Saturday night. What? Before we met? Well, yeah, before we met, Friday morning, we met, uh, Saturday. Okay. Um, I mentioned on the game, we were playing a game together as usual. Mm -hmm. Uh, something we were working on in the game, it, it was kind of bugging out on my end. Mm -hmm. And I'm not the smartest when it comes to the software, I'm more of like the hardware when it comes to the computers. He's a software type of person, and I asked him if he could come help me out. You know, he said yes. I told him I could pick him up real quick. I went and I picked him up and came by. He helped me with it. Went to leave. No one to walk out. He said he'd walk. It was fine. Went, okay, go cool. out the door behind him. That's the last time I saw him. Police were able to confirm that Dakota, under the username Coffee Chew, 
messaged Sam, a.k.a. Excarval, on the night in question, asking him to come over. Later that same night, Dakota sent a follow-up message indicating that he was still having difficulties. But Sam never responded. Instead, Dakota was contacted by Sam's father the next morning as he began the frantic search for his son. This story aligned perfectly with what Dakota had previously told police, maybe too perfectly. But when they did a brief search of his property, hoping to find clues as to which way Sam might have gone, they found nothing incriminating. However, they did notice a small trailhead in the backyard. For reasons Dakota is about to share, it didn't seem likely that Sam had gone that way. Did you have talk on the way there? Not too much. He just asked what exactly was going on, and I'll wait. I'm not sure. I think I messed up the code somewhere. It, it was punched in numbers on the script for the game, and I always messed it up a lot because I'm not good with numbers. Mm-hmm. So I just, you know, I told him what was going on. He said, okay, look at it when we got there. That's it. It's only about not even a five minute drive from my house to his. So. Okay. And at the time, he wasn't wearing any shoes, or did he bring his shoes? No, he wasn't wearing any shoes. Okay. When did his father come over? Um, it was about 5 p.m. yesterday. I just got home from, like I said, my family was visiting and everything from Florida. I just got home from that and he showed up about the time I showed up. It was about 5 p.m. Oh, Sunday? Yes. What did that ask you? You know, he asked if I had seen him. Um, he saw the messages where, you know, me and him came over because Sam had his laptop unlocked and so his dad went to messaging people clearly with him that knew where he was. He said he saw the message that we hung out, so he came by. He went and saw Zach because I told him where I lived. And so he came by and he said, I've seen him. I told him about the trails. Yeah, so I mind walking them with him. And that's when we went and walked the trails. It's hard to believe that Sam would have cut through the woods barefoot at any time, much less the middle of the night. Even though Sam's father had already walked the trails, the police made a second search of the trail. The effort was brief, a choice they may come to regret. Did, uh, did you try to contact Sam after that, after he left? Yeah, I did. Uh, I messaged him by, by 3 o'clock, I think. I asked him if he'd be back yet. Because I didn't see him get online. Yeah, about 3 o'clock in the morning, about an hour after he left. Uh, the thing shows whenever you get online or when you're offline or just away, whatever it feels like you are. And, but it says when you're online, and I didn't see that he got back online. I asked him if he was there, and I told him it was working. I asked him if he wanted to play, and he never messaged me back. Typically, at this point in an investigation, police would have attempted to trace a missing person's cell phone. However, while going through the Poss home looking for clues, they discovered Sam's phone in his bedroom. His computer was still there as well, which his family and friends all said he never would have left behind. And what was um, Sam's demeanor? I thought you saw how he was strong or anything like that. I just seemed normal. I'm not super personal with him. I know face was first mama. He just seemed normal, like Sam. Detectives then wrap up the interview with Dakota. Now that they had followed up on all the potential leads and found nothing, police actually had fewer clues than when they'd started the investigation. But not for long. A few days later, they got a lead out of left field. Knowing that the search for Sam was still on, a high schooler came forward to share a concerning conversation he'd had with a classmate on the bus. Tell me what happened. I got on the bus and he looked upset, so I went to him and he you know, sat in front of me. And you know, I asked me a question. He said, Did you figure out something? You know, I did something bad, which is the rest of me. And I wish I wanted more information, of course. So I he said, what if the law went after me? And then I told him, I'd still be your friend even if it was murder. Because people make mistakes, but their mistakes don't make them who they are. Unless you don't like them. And then we just kept talking like that for a while. Like, then he told me that it was murder. Did he tell you how he did it or anything like that? He didn't tell me that much. He told me that he was ashamed of it, though. That's why he was asking me the question in the first place, because he knew that he was about to get caught. 
The boy who had confessed to his friend was 18-year-old Brandon Warren. He attended a neighboring high school, and if he was telling the truth, this would be the first murder in the town of Perry in eight years. Sam having disappeared made the prospect that the story could be credible all the more likely. But there was one big problem with this theory. The two didn't know each other, not in person or online. Police now faced the awful reality that they may no longer be looking for Sam, but rather Sam's body. In addition to this startling information, the quote, who could love you but the mold that sprouts from your cold, sad corpse, was posted to Brandon's social media. Police were ready to pivot their investigation to focus on Brandon when they received another lead, this one even more puzzling than the first, since it came from a young man in Oklahoma. Instead of pointing the finger at Brandon, this tip targeted Dakota. I mean, he got online just like normal, and I was just like, hey, because we usually chat every day. And I was, this is Dakota you're talking yes. about? Okay. And I was just like, hey, what's up? What's going on? And he's like, uh, just got back pretty tired. I did something you're probably not going to believe. And I was like, shoot, let me, let me hear it. He's like, I killed someone. I was like, okay, yeah, you're right. I don't believe you, you know? And then I didn't even figure out who it was until I think three, three or four days later, I just kind of entertained the thought. I was like, okay, so like what happened? Why'd you do it? Like, were you in danger? Did somebody, like, threaten you or anything? And he's like, no, I just want to know what it felt like to kill someone. Apparently, this informant was a long-distance friend of both Dakota and Sam. Along with a few other boys, the group had met at random while playing a game called Rust. They ended up liking each other and decided to stay in touch through Discord. According to the tip, Dakota had taken it upon himself to use the platform as a confessional. From memory, Dakota's friend took it upon himself to share what Dakota told him and another friend. The message he sent read, I asked him, Dakota, how his night was, and he said, Oh, pretty interesting, did something you won't believe. I asked him to elaborate, and he said, I killed someone. I immediately brushed it off as, but he continued on about it, so I asked, How did you do it? And the next words he said literally sent chills down my body. He said, I asked the guy to come help with my computer and gave him a ride, and from there, we killed him. I asked him to continue and asked what he had learned, not thinking he was serious, and he said, Bodies are heavy. I'm glad my friend was with me, not skipping a beat or with any remorse. The friend of Dakota's went on to write, I can't believe he perished at the hands of someone he trusted as a friend. I'm tearing up as I'm typing this, but I'm so sorry. I knew and couldn't do anything, and Sam is gone. Dakota told me this as soon as he got home that same night. God damn it, I'm so sorry. Dakota and Brandon practically tortured Sam and felt no remorse about it. He f said it took around 30 minutes to an hour before the deed was done, and Sam stopped breathing. I know this is hard for you to read, and dude, it's something I will never forget. An innocent life gone for literally no reason. I can't believe what would drive someone to commit such an evil act and calmly tell someone over the internet hours after it happened. The friend went on to add, He mentioned that he didn't want you to find out. I remember that. His chuckle after he told me he went to help find Sam is something I will never unhear or forget. When police received this information, they likely assumed that the victim in question had to be Sam Poss. After all, no other local had been reported to be missing which reinforced everyone's worst fears. However, they had yet to find a body and had only the claims of a few boys to go on. They were going to need a lot more information if they wanted to locate Sam, alive or dead. 
when he just came to me with this, it was just completely out of the blue. I didn't expect any of this. There was no signs leading up to it. Okay. And I just kept thinking to myself, like, why, though? Why? There's literally no reason. You're throwing away basically your life when his life wasn't even too bad, in my opinion. And after that, I was like, you know, like, holy shit. If you're being for real, you killed somebody. Like, yeah. you're going to have to live with this. Further messages between the friend and Dakota reveal just how callous Dakota's confession was. The friend wrote, I asked him again in disbelief, why? You literally ended someone's life, hell, a friend's life, someone who trusted you, for what, no reason? He then replied, yeah, I was just curious about what it was like. I replied in shock with, I'm glad I don't live around you. I would hate for one of us to have to die should that situation be repeated. I then asked afterwards, why are you telling me if you're actually serious about this? Why me? Dakota then said, because you don't know where I live or live near me. When sharing the confession with other members of the group, the friend said, I've never talked to someone and had a feeling of complete coldness overtake me. But as he went into details about it, like, holy shit, I was freaked out. Understandably, the Discord group went wild, and there was a lot of speculation as to what had driven Dakota to do such a thing, as well as anger. One member wrote, I wonder what truly makes someone do this. Like, it can't just be for no reason. As if that wasn't incriminating enough. Dakota's aunt also reported that she had reason to believe her nephew had been involved, based on something she had heard from Dakota's mother. Right away, police brought Dakota's mother, Rebecca, in for a conversation. When did you, like, um, what's the system? What day? According to Rebecca, Dakota had come to her house and announced that he'd killed someone. Distraught, Rebecca had gone to her sister and asked her to call the police as she couldn't bear to turn in her own son. Did you ever thought he would do something like this? No. Like I said, uh, he, had, he had done so much better. And I was doing well enough that he could out of it. Dakota's mother thought he'd outgrown his diagnosis of bipolar disorder, which she said he'd been diagnosed with around the age of 10. By age 15, however, he allegedly stopped taking his prescribed medication. Recently, however, friends and family members alike reported that Dakota had been struggling with his mental health and had allegedly even attempted to take his life a few weeks back. Rebecca's memory of Dakota's behavior on the night following the alleged murder is perhaps even more disturbing than his casual Discord confession. Yeah, he just seemed like he was tired. Because you seem like he was tired. Yeah. And that's, he stays up all the time in video games, so he stays up all night. Okay. Yeah, we'll take a power nap. Yeah. Yeah, I So that's all you, all the changes you saw him. Now police faced a predicament. Before, they had no leads, but now they had two viable suspects, Brandon and Dakota. Both of their alleged confessions lined up with the timing of Sam's disappearance. Neither of them, however, had named Sam as their victim. Also, police were struggling to make a connection between all three boys. Brandon and Sam didn't seem to know each other at all. And while Brandon and Dakota were known to talk occasionally, no one reported that they were particularly close. With more questions than ever, police turned to Dakota to clear things up. You got no problem. You want to make, take a gallon? I mean, I, I met you briefly the other yeah. day. I thought so. Yeah, I met you. Yours? I brought it in here for you. Zero. 42, 85. 42, 85. Yeah, sweet check, sweet check. There you go. All right, Dakota. Here's what I want to talk to you about, boy. Sir. I'm going to have a little bit more in-depth conversation about this parent. With Mr. Foss. Okay. Um... 
we've been living more for several days. And we hadn't found him yet. His mom and dad and his family are extremely, extremely distraught. And you can understand that. And you will one day when you have kids. Okay. One day. Okay. So you know you know how upset they are. Okay. With that being said, we need to find him. Okay. Now we've been to your house a couple times, we talked to you, we talked to the rest of the people in there. Uh, in your household. And there's more pieces of the puzzle that we've come across that um, has opened a few avenues and a few leads that um, we need to discuss with you. Okay. It's going to be good. Okay. But at a certain time in our lives, we've got a man up. Okay. Notice how Dakota goes very still and very quiet. He's demonstrating the freeze response here, likely triggered by the pressure the detective is putting on him. Significantly, even though he's pressing for information, the officer maintains the good rapport he's built with Dakota and hopes Dakota may be willing to talk. Additionally, the officer is already planting seeds of doubt in Dakota's mind by hinting that they have evidence implicating him, which they do. Police officers may use this strategy to test the suspect's reaction by letting the suspect know there's strong evidence against them. They may observe their behavior, gauge their level of involvement, or prompt them to reveal additional details. Kind of tell me, go, go back over that night when he came over to the house. No, he does, like, starting from, from, start, start from the beginning. So, <clears throat> sitting at home, no, we're doing something with the video game, as I said. The phrase, like I said, is a reference statement and isn't a good start to convincing the police he's innocent as it's a red flag for deception. Interrogators pay attention to such statements as they may indicate the individual's attempt to maintain a consistent narrative or to draw attention to specific points they want to emphasize. I was having a little bit of issues with it, appeared to be easier. She came personally to show me, so just not to explain everything, so I asked him if he would mind coming over. They did not mind. So I told him I would just come pick them up. And if I asked him, I left my house, picked them up, came over to the house. I went in, he did all my computer stuff for me. You know, he showed me what to do. Made it a lot quicker and easier. Then, you know, we went to walk out and say, you know, it's fine. I stopped far. He left, I locked the door behind him. It sounds rehearsed. It lacks emotion. And it seems he's giving as little information as possible in an effort to minimize how many lies he'll have to recall next time he's asked to give details regarding what happened that night. There's no actual story to it, and it's almost like bullet points that he's hitting instead of a description of events. The officers definitely won't accept this version without a lot more questioning, which they begin immediately. Okay, let's stop for a minute. Okay. Okay. I want you to think real hard about what I said just a second ago. And that is, is that there's other pieces of the, the puzzle that we've uncovered that you don't know about. And in this world, honesty is your saving grace. It's just your own, I mean, that, that's your friend, okay? Tell me what really happened that night. But so far, the only thing I've been fully honest about was I have spoke with you multiple times. I did tell you I was alone the rest of the night that I haven't left my house. Mm -hmm. I left somewhere around 30 gallons. I stopped to get gas at this point in time. Where did you stop to get gas at? Uh, the flash foods over, uh, you know, over all the gas stations are in the flash foods. The Marathon place goes two flash foods there. Mm -hmm. uh, the bigger one by the car lot. Notice that Dakota uses the qualifier so far when talking about his dishonesty. But so far, the only thing I've been fully honest about was did tell you I was alone the rest of the night. Indicating that he may try lying again as the interview continues. Police were able to obtain CCTV footage and confirmed that Dakota had purchased gas. However, this also revealed that there was more to his story than he was letting on. We'll dig into the details of that soon. Not long after Dakota makes this admission, his story changes a second time. Apparently, the gas station hadn't been his only stop. 
But I left my house at a certain time after two o'clock, and after Sam left and everything. Who did you go speak? Uh, dude named Brandon. Okay, Brandon who? Warren, W A R R E N. Now that's a name police are familiar with. Brandon Warren was the other boy who confessed to murder. Perhaps the two leads weren't as separate as they initially appeared. Police may have wanted to speak to Brandon as well, but he refused to speak to detectives, leaving Dakota as the only one with answers. I believe that. I, I believe part of that. Okay. Um, because I know that Brandon was around the area. Okay. Um, there was a lot. There, 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 there was more that went on, though. Okay. And now is your opportunity to get all this off your chest. Okay. Listen to me. I look at you in the eye right now. I'm telling you. I know that you've got a burden on you right now. I know that for a fact. I talk to some people. I know you have a burden on you right now. Here, the officer is doubling down on the seeds of doubt, trying to get Dakota to include more details in his extremely limited story by insinuating they have evidence against him. I talked to some people. I know you have a burden on you right now. In theory, an innocent person would not be bothered by the more evidence statement as they would have confidence that nothing would point to them. A guilty party, on the other hand, may hesitate or try to figure out what evidence police could have in order to explain it away. The officer is also appealing to Dakota's morals and ethics by emphasizing the importance of honesty. He also may be attempting to establish rapport by making him believe the police think he is a good guy, or as stated earlier, able to man up or face it like a man. They may also be attempting to create cognitive dissonance within Dakota, pushing him to make an admission and do what's right by overthinking the consequences of getting caught. They're expecting that his identification with being a good man would be inconsistent with being dishonest or deceitful. This idea of him being good but hiding this secret would then cause heightened anxiety internally, which would then show externally, giving the police an indication of the things they should hone in on. Of course, this is all contingent upon Dakota believing a good man is honest and kind. I know you're a scared 18-year-old kid. That some very, very bad stuff happens, and now it's time to come to grips with it. Okay. So, tell me what tell me what happened in your car. You can do it, and I'm telling you, it's going to eat your soul. Damn, not a lie. It only took 10 minutes for police to get Dakota to make the tragic admission that Sam was no longer alive. The twisted circumstances of his death and the haunting reason why, however, remained as elusive as Sam's location. Police were faced with the daunting task of notifying Sam's parents that their son was deceased. In turn, the Poss family set their own grief aside long enough to notify those closest to Sam of the painful situation. Sam's good friend Brayson was willing to share what it was like to get the terrible news that Sam wouldn't be coming home. And I remember, I don't remember what time it was in the morning, but uh, I was passed out. My mother, she came into my room crying. She gave me the phone and it was, uh, it was uh, Nicole, was Sam's mother, and she was telling me what happened. And I just remember... Uh, everything just didn't feel real. It just felt like I was just in a dark room and I was just hearing her voice telling me what happened, um, that Sam was murdered. You know, like after that, everything is almost like a dream. Like, I don't remember much of it. Back in the interrogation room, the police buckle down to get the details from Dakota However, they need to be very careful not to damage the rapport they've built so far. Because Dakota didn't have a cell phone and Sam left his at home that fateful night, they can't digitally retrace their steps. This means police have no way to find the body unless Dakota leads them to it. They'll need to proceed very cautiously to ensure they don't lose their most valuable source of information. 
What happened? Look at me. Look at me. You gonna be I'm telling you son. You, you got you got a burden on you right now. And it's gonna eat your soul. Tell me what happened that day. I don't even know what happened though. Tell me how it happened. And I, I don't know. I was just having very bad thoughts lately, you know. Um, not too long ago, I also talked to a committed suicide on the front line, doctor's reports or somewhere. Yeah. And all the things are, I just felt like I could kill someone. Okay. No. Well, let, let, me, let me answer this. Did you, did you kill Sam by yourself? No. Who was with you when Sam, when, when Sam left this world? Great. Brandon Warren. And how did that happen? Um, Brandon has come to Harlan too. I know Brandon's the one who killed us though. You were going to kill us. Yes. Before we kill us, I was just kind of wanted to go fight to take a life. Okay. Knowing what we do now, Dakota's Facebook posts calling attention to the case no longer appear as thoughtfulness from a worried friend, but something far more sinister. Earlier posts, including one that says, I wouldn't mind taking a knife, shoving it into someone's throat, and just watch them choke on their own blood until they die. And another that says, one cut, two cuts, three cuts, four, how many more till I hit the floor? become even more unsettling. But perhaps the most haunting is a post that simply says, shh, made just two days before Sam's death. How long have you been having, how long have you been having thoughts about killing yourself? I've never liked life. It's, uh, it is pointless to me. You're, you're such a, but, but talking to you, I mean, you talk intelligently, you're, I don't understand that. Though. I mean, I, 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 like, I like to learn about stuff. You know, I, mean, I made myself smart. You know, I ain't never done much of school or anything, but I like to look up anything I don't know. I, mean, I am smart for myself if I ain't never, I ain't never seen a point in uh, living life because I just always look, you know, you live to die. And no matter how you live it, you still die in the end. I just never seen a point why, why you got to laugh. How long have y'all been thinking about killing someone? Just one day. It was all a matter of one day. Did you remember Brandon talking on the phone about it, or? No, we had been investing a little, and the whole suicide thing rolled around, and the suggestion that popped up was, do you want to go like, to kill someone before you go? It didn't matter how much we were, and then I had the words. Clearly, they didn't follow through with this part of the pact. However, what followed is so disturbing, it's beyond comprehension. What, what happened to that part of the plan? I don't, I don't really know. It never got brought up after that. We just we worked on the body, and we just went our separate ways. You know, we ain't really talk since then. As the grim reality of the situation continues to set in, police are faced with what must be the most difficult part of Dakota's confession to listen to, the details of how he and Brandon took Sam's life. Hopefully, he'll also finally reveal where the body can be found. But even as he makes a confession, Dakota leaves out key details that reveal his true depths of depravity. So, did Sam ever come in the house, or y'all did this? In the, did y'all, which y'all did this in the driveway of your house before he? So yeah, he never came in the house. You know? How did how did how did y'all kill Sam? <laughs> I sat in the back seat of my car. Brandon drove my car. And from his house, we didn't ask if he could help me with the computer problem. We went to his house and picked him up. And my driveway, I crashed him. And so, so, you know, Brandon stabbed him two times. Brandon stabbed him three times? Where did he stab him at? Just in the chest area? Yeah. Around the same time that Dakota was brought back into the station, Brandon was also placed under arrest. Police searched the house he shared with his aunt, collecting electronics, clothing, and shoes as evidence. They also brought up the topic of evidence with Dakota, perhaps in the hopes that a trail of physical evidence could help lead them to Sam's location. 
Did, uh, what, have you done anything to your car? Was there, after he stabbed him, was there blood anywhere? Oh, there was, there was blood everywhere in that car. Um, I spent about a good 10 hours on myself. Uh, just by yourself? Yeah, I just, you know, I went and sold some stuff. I just bought, got refunds, and bought a bunch of cleaning supplies, and just tried to do the best I could, and I couldn't get rid of the car, clearly. You know? The item Dakota returned was a headset he'd purchased from GameStop. Although the item was returned, Dakota will later reveal that he found a new, disturbing use for the bag it came in. However, that's where Dakota's reliability stalls out. Based on a conversation police had with Dakota's stepfather, Ken, police were inclined to believe that this part of Dakota's story was, once again, not the full truth. What do you do uh, Sunday morning? It seems obvious that cherry soda and blood do not look the same, and it would be difficult to mix the two up. Dakota's stepfather appears to know this and may have been in denial, trying to convince himself that he wasn't looking at blood or helping to clean it up. This denial very likely could have been a panic response. He knows Dakota and may be trying to help him by believing his story about the soda. However, as his stepfather shares this story, he engages in some anchor point movements, but then goes very still at other points. It's clear he has heightened anxiety, and by now, he probably knows exactly what's going on and that it was actually blood. How big was his thing when you saw it? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's on the bottom. Like, okay, right here, this part seat. On that part seat? That's that. Just... It wasn't that bad. It looked like, you know, that took you the concrete steps in my house. It looked like that, like a grape, but it wasn't. It was like an old thing. Like the old thing? Gray mm -hmm. stone? Yeah, it's like gray stone. It wasn't even like brown or nothing, too. Okay. This testimony was enough to justify a search warrant for Dakota's car. However, police found that the passenger seat where the alleged cherry soda stain had been was now perfectly clean. Using a black light, police found evidence of some biological fluid luminescing on the center console. Further testing revealed that the substance in question was, in fact, blood. What, what clothes were y'all wearing that night? Because I'm sure, did you, what did you do with the clothes? Brandon's shorts got burned because there was blood on them. Where did burn it? Who burned it? Did he just, just where, where did the shorts get burned? That's what this option wants to know. Uh, I have my mom's house, which other day they have fires at night, not to the box over there. To the box house? Yeah. They have a fire pit in the front yard, like I said. I'm like, hey, I have no fire at night. They were. Like I said, my grandmother was in town, and mm -hmm. family in town, mm -hmm. so I said they might be having a fire. Because mm -hmm. I had everything, anything we had ever touched, stuff on the trash bag. You know, I'll come to the tunnel of fire, got some trash cleaned up. Okay. Uh, I did a box on the fire, but you know, the, the sheets were in it. The hit the brain had a pair of shorts. Despite what Dakota says about burning the evidence, police were unable to confirm his story. His mother said that she didn't see him add anything to the bonfire like he claimed, and when police searched the fire pit itself, all they found was ash. Police also checked with Dakota's grandmother, who he lived with full time, on the off chance that she'd seen or noticed anything out of the ordinary. Did um, Dakota seem distraught or anything like that? No, he seemed like. 
Dakota's grandparents had been out of town the night Sam went missing, raising the question of just how planned out the attack had been. If it truly was a spur-of-the-moment decision, like Dakota is implying, it would be awfully convenient that the house happened to be empty. The question of premeditation is added to the list of answers police are looking for, alongside the primary goal of finding Sam. We said that uh, he choked him. He choked him with the wire. Yeah, I tried to hit me, but it, what kind of wire was it? It was, um, it was probably like a story of a telephone wire. Telephone? Oh, okay. okay. It was on, um, I just picked up the tape with me. You didn't try it that way or... Once that broke down, what did you use? On. Um, um, I was standing in the back of the room or on the seat. Okay. Did he struggle? Not really at all. Did he say anything? Uh, whenever the wire broke, he asked what we were doing. The only thing I said was, I'm sorry. What did Brandon say? Brandon never said anything about the whole thing. Uh, and he didn't say nothing. He just kind of stood there for a minute. Dakota's trying to position himself as the nicer of the two of them here by acting like he said he's sorry, while Brandon didn't say anything. This is also probably an attempt to be more believable. Remember, people tend to believe people that they like, and it's easier to be liked if you come across as nice. This is an important manipulation tactic. However, Dakota slips up here. He states that Brandon just kind of stood there, but that wouldn't be possible if they killed him in the car. Is it possible that Dakota is hiding something, or did he just make a mistake in a statement? I say seven one said Samuel after he got stabbed, did he all scream? He never said anything. That's completely fine. Why that it's not like he even struggled either. He put his hands up there, but it's not like he was pulling on me or anything. He just took it. So did you have your arm around his neck when you felt the light leave his body? Yeah, I held for quite a while, probably about 20 minutes. Is it time that you could hold? I just wanted to make sure he's dead. I don't want him to feel any more than he had to after he had stabbed him, especially, you know. At that point, I just wanted to make sure he was dead and make sure he wasn't in pain. This is a shocking way to try and once again paint himself as the good guy or nice guy. He's trying to make it sound as though he put Sam out of his misery, which is absurd given that he just admitted to strangling him. It's not like I did this and enjoyed it. You know, I felt bad for the wire after the wire broke and everything. I kind of thought I'm like, okay, well, no. Stop then. The loss of Sam took a huge toll on the Poss family and changed their lives in countless ways. In addition to grieving, Sam's father, Chris, faced serious professional consequences that changed the course of his career, which he was willing to discuss in an exclusive interview with Iwu. I couldn't do the work I was doing anymore because of the constant reminders of Sam. Um, during the trial, um, I knew he had been strangled. You know, that's we knew the cause of death. Uh, during the actual trials, the medical examiner explained that he'd been strangled with an ethernet cable like you use for computers to connect to a network. Um, I was doing IT work for a hospital at the time and constantly using and plugging in and carrying around ethernet cables. And um, I didn't realize at the time, but um, every time I was interacting with the cable, I was getting a subconscious image of Sam's murder. As if that wasn't horrific enough, Dakota offered up even more details, this time about the knife used to stab Sam in the chest and torso. There's two knives. One was not involved. Uh, we uh, started having trust issues right after that. And we threw away it and, uh, another knife that was just in the car. Neither of us had used it. It was in the car. We didn't trust each other at the time. 
Or is it, you know, like, stab each other? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And I'll trust you right now. Right? And we, uh, we're going to put these knives away and not touch them. Did you just send the Facebook message that said, um, I'm still having trouble when you get home? I was just uh, like the theme thing that I brought up. Right? cover up thing. Yeah. Just to make it make your make it look a little better in case we got to looking into well, that. Because I messaged them and asked me to come over, so I messaged them, hey, you back. <laughs> Establishing that Dakota thought to send this message after the murder could help to prove premeditation, which might affect the charges he will face. Now that investigators know Dakota attempted to cover up his wrongdoing, they transition to the grisly details of the deadly attack. What were you thinking while that was going on? While you had all of him and he was stabbing him, what was your thought process at that time? I just wanted to stop him. From the first time I grabbed him, uh, it started with a, a wire. I didn't want to touch him. The wire broke. And I didn't want to do it again after that. He hadn't been stabbed at this point, but I was like, and it went too far. You know, we kind of knew we were trying to, and at that time, I thought we had to die, you know. And we kind of just let him walk away at that point. And, Wanted it to be over. Where did the wire go that you had used? It's around his neck or his body. Uh, I'll leave him in his car. We didn't trust him. We had a bag around the whole while we were inside. We didn't have to be together. I couldn't punch out the wire, so it just stayed. The bag Dakota used was actually the GameStop bag he used to take his headset back to the store so he could buy cleaning supplies. Even more horrific, when confronted with CCTV footage from the gas station, it comes to light that Brandon was with Dakota when he got gas that night. And worse, they weren't alone. Sam's body was still in the trunk. Clearly, Dakota and Brandon had done something with the body after stopping for gas, but what exactly they did is far more horrifying than investigators can even imagine. Police don't jump right into that line of questioning, however choosing instead to finish addressing Dakota's motive and thoughts first. So had y'all considered, had y'all considered just like picking a random person? Yeah, I mean, that's just kind of what it was, you know, just thing. what we were trying to think about, you know, like, do we, I mean, we can just drive till we find someone walking or go up in someone's house or something like that. And then it's not you like, I mean, I could probably get someone over to my house in less than five minutes and be like, who else? This is very interesting to talk to you, I'll be honest with you. Is, did y'all, did y'all ever discuss how old, how young they could, I mean, did, did you like say, okay, we're not gonna hurt anybody under 16, or we're not gonna hurt a child? Or about some little kid that I didn't know too. Once again, Dakota makes Brandon out to be the worse of the two in an attempt to make himself the more likable one. He seems to believe that establishing likability or an otherwise positive connection might lead investigators to be more lenient with him, or even understanding. He may even believe it could influence the way his case is handled. What if, what if, you would, what if Sam would have said, I can't? What would y'all have done that night? No, because... Um, Brandon. No, I mean, if Sam said, I can't come over. I mean, we might have to the possibilities of... I was trying to eliminate the possibility of just someone else, but it's some random person. You don't know how many people are in there, then you got people with guns, you got... You have people who will definitely beat us, you know. He even seems to be trying to minimize the crime by saying they only targeted Sam. But I mean, there's a thought process. There was actually a thought process that went behind it. I mean, you just, I mean, you thought about it. Yeah. I mean, you thought that I'm not, I mean, it may be a stupid idea just to run up in anybody's house yeah. because somebody like me yeah. might be in there. Yeah, you know, like, you know, we don't know the number of people. We don't know, you know, what they are. The detective is very careful to clarify that Brandon and Dakota thought about and planned their crime ahead of time, again establishing premeditation, which can significantly increase the punishment they're sure to face. Despite planning the crime and attempting to cover his tracks, Dakota has a surprising revelation about how the act made him feel. I mean, I know I want to get away with it. I'm not too bad to just kill my little brother, too, you know. Dakota's online friend from Oklahoma confirmed that Dakota had not been himself since the crime. He'd been bragging on Discord almost immediately after Sam went missing. Four days later, his online friends turned him into the police, and that same day, October 20th, Brandon and Dakota were arrested. 
I also noticed as the days progressed, he was basically, I guess, going mad. He was like the guilt or something was driving him mad because he was hearing stuff. People were supposedly coming into his house and he would go leave and go check and no one was there. And then I remember one time he said that like there was a, like a townwide search for Sam and he had to go help and he made sure to emphasize that and he kind of laughed about it. I was like, why are you laughing about it? He's like, because I basically know where he's at. And at that point, I just tried. I, I didn't really talk to him very much after that. And but the times that I did, it just his it was either his paranoia or whatever. But it was just I could see that it was driving him insane. While everything police have uncovered so far is absolutely shocking, what comes next might be the most heartbreaking part of all. Why don't you pick him? Tragically, it appears that Dakota and Brandon targeted Sam because of his kind and giving nature. Sam's father attested to this aspect of his son's personality and speaks on what it's been like to live with the loss. He was a smart aleck. He was also generous and would help anybody at the drop of a hat. Nicole, Sam's mom, talks about the dash. Um, you know, when you look at a, a grave marker, you know, you have 1998-2016, dash and that dash encompasses his entire life, and it was a good dash. Yeah, we wanted a lot more time, obviously, but, you know, that, that wasn't our choice to make. Sam's friend Brayson had similar memories of Sam's kindness and generosity. So, growing up, uh, if you had a problem, Sam would be there to help you fix it. Uh, he might call you names a little bit, but he's still there. Like his intentions are to help you and get you to understand what you did wrong. In addition to incorporating Sam's memory into his daily life, Brayson also gave his son the middle name Samuel. Finally, perhaps under the weight of his own guilt, police questioning, or both, Dakota is finally moved to reveal what he and Brandon did with the body. It's not as far away as you might expect. Where is Sam? In the back of Lake Village. In the creek. Yeah. He's in the back of Lake Village. Okay. okay. So Sam is now. Will you, um, will you, if, will you help, if we take you out there, will you help us find him? I can take you right to it. Okay. Do you mind doing that? I don't mind at all. So we can't leave for cover just, you know, yeah. goodbye for his family. Okay. Arrangements are made for Dakota to accompany a search team so that they can retrieve the body. Like, you know, I told y'all if y'all go down, if you like towards the left, mm -hmm. um, we have a tarp on top of it too, on top above the dirt. I think there's a tarp. There should be a recycling bin near where the left is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there's a bleach bottle and some other trash that's just kind of piled. Uh, I guess I think the All recycling right. bin is near where okay. you look at. Leaving Dakota in the care of another officer, the detectives take great care to only walk on the scrub and foliage to avoid disturbing evidence that might be on the trail. Their efforts were not in vain, because when the sun rose, the crime scene team were able to identify tire tracks that matched Dakota's car. In just a few minutes, they come across a suspicious mound of earth and garbage. You think that's it? No, that's not a tarp. I know, but that's a dirt hole. Oh, but that doesn't look like it's been moved. Just I'll tell you what, move that carpet just to make me feel better. Since it's looking more and more likely that this is the location of the body, they get the go-ahead to disturb the scene with a more in-depth search. There's a black sheet like something right here. I don't know if you can pull it. See that right there? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's, I mean, that's, yeah. not, there's stab wounds right there. Yeah, yeah that's enough. Okay. And shirt. Okay. All right. Let's back out of here. 
Tragically, though not unexpectedly, the body was determined to be that of Sam Poss. Sadly, it seemed police had been very close to Sam's body at the start of the investigation, because the trail that led to the body was none other than the one leading to Dakota's backyard. Had the search strayed just a little further from the path, Sam's body might have been recovered much sooner and in better condition. The sheet used to wrap the body was taken as evidence, along with the Ethernet cable and aux cord still wrapped around Sam's throat. An autopsy revealed that Sam might have survived the stabbing if he received medical attention. This sketch of the scene, provided by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, shows just how close to the road Sam's body was. After he was arrested, Dakota made a call from jail, which was recorded, to his ex-girlfriend, Lamia Glover. He was awaiting trial and gleefully told Lamia that he thought he would not be facing a murder charge and wanted to share the good news. So I could still be charged with aggravated assault for attempting to strangulation. With aggravated assault, still carries a good amount of time, but I'd be able to take first fingers on it. So I don't know the time because I don't know the system like that. So they try to stick me with an aggravated assault because all y'all can that murder charge me but the autopsy revealed that asphyxiation due to strangulation is how Sam died, so it appears that Dakota was seriously misinformed. But they did drop one, that's one step closer, um, and the next couple months, that other one could get dropped once the fingerprints come back off the knife, because I never touched it, but as long as the fingerprints come up on it, it'll get dropped, and that means I won't have a murder charge. Okay, well, I love you, baby. Uh, I'm, I'm glad that Dakota's celebration turned out to be premature because he did end up facing a murder charge, two of them in fact. Dakota and Brandon were tried separately and testified against each other. In their testimonies, each boy blamed the other for instigating the crime, but when it came down to it, only Brandon's DNA was found on the knife. The cause of death, as you may remember, was strangulation, which Dakota confessed to, which made him equally culpable. Even though Dakota and Brandon both pleaded not guilty, they were both convicted just a week apart on a grand total of six charges. A second-degree felony of malice murder, felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault, tampering with evidence, and concealing a death. When it came time for the trial, the Poss family made a decision that may perhaps surprise you in regards to how they would proceed legally. At the heart of the choice was the desire to respect the beliefs of their late son. Sam was um, very smart and very cognizant of, I mean, like grown up themes, even as like a 10 year old and realized that he didn't really believe in the death penalty. Um, he said killing somebody for killing somebody doesn't make sense to him. The Poss family did not ask for the death penalty when the case came to trial, despite the brutality of the crime and the unimaginable depth of their loss. As a result, Dakota and Brandon were both sentenced to life without parole. Though both boys have appealed this decision, the original sentence stands and they remain behind bars. Sam is also memorialized through a charity set up by his family. Each year, they collect donations for a scholarship that funds two students' marching band dues, allowing those who wish to join but can't afford it the opportunity to enjoy something Sam loved. We thought it would be a way to, to honor Sam. Um, he wasn't going to be able to directly impact the world because he was gone, so this was a way we could kind of make that impact happen even though he wasn't here anymore and it, it helped us in giving us a a purpose for the senselessness of it um because it's still senseless but now there's something that a, a positive outcome because of it it's, it's easy to just focus on the darkness and then just kind of get mired in that but we've um the world's a darker place without Sam in it, but talking about him and remembering him brings some of that light back.
while no scholarship or memory will bring Sam back, he remains alive in the hearts of those who love him and seek to live out their lives with him in mind. We want to sincerely thank everyone who spoke with us.